China is refusing to back down over its new security law imposed upon Hong Kong despite a wave of international condemnation. Today, the Chinese ambassador to the United Kingdom accused that country of, quote, gross interference. That was in response to the U.K.'s offer of a path to citizenship for millions of Hong Kongers. The U.K. has rejected China's accusation. Last week, Canada responded to China's new security law by suspending its extradition treaty with China. Could the U.K. do the same? And how should the Western world respond to China's increasingly belligerent diplomacy? Susan Lejeune Dalgerjek is the U.K. High Commissioner to Canada, and she joins me now. High Commissioner, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, Your country has had some issues with China. Canada has had some issues with China. The world, it seems, or the Western world, it seems to be having issues with China. Is there any sense from your point of view that the diplomatic pressure that is being brought to bear is having any impact on Chinese behavior? Um, I think uh, it's probably too early to say that, but I think what it has shown, and I think particularly the consistency of the response from a number of countries, not just mine and not just Canada, uh, is that uh, people are looking at what China is doing and that people are not prepared, countries are not prepared just to let them do whatever they want. And I think particularly the most recent development with the imposition of this national security law, um, the the international response has been quite consistent uh, and loud. um, And we have all said that this is an unacceptable development. One of, one of the responses from the UK on the Hong Kong issue has been to offer a path to citizenship uh, for approximately three million uh, people in Hong Kong. That's been described by the Chinese as gross interference, and they want you to reconsider this. Is this something that is on the table for the UK? No, no, it's not. Um, uh, we have every right to do this. Uh, the people concerned are the holders of a certain type of British passport. Um, and all we are doing is, is is making sure that those people, if they want to, will have the right to come initially and work in the UK, work and live in the UK, and after that to convert, convert their passports into uh, standard British passports. We think that's part of our historic responsibility towards those people. I imagine you anticipate that China will respond to that, though, if you proceed as planned. What kind of a response do you expect from the Chinese government on this? I think it's very difficult to tell, but they they have used a range of of tools, as Canada knows, only to its cost. So uh, I don't think uh, anybody uh, would be surprised if there were uh, measures taken. But uh, as I said, we believe we have a responsibility to those nearly three million people, and we will continue to to give them the, the rights and the protection that they deserve. Are you worried, though, that British nationals could be targeted the way Canadian nationals seem to have been targeted in in diplomatic tensions between these two countries? Well, as you know, uh, one of the members of our uh, Hong Kong consulate, uh, a locally engaged member of staff, a holder of a British passport, was was detained by the Chinese not that long ago. Mm -hmm. So we have already been subject to that sort of behavior. So Canada has announced a series of measures in response to this new national security law uh, imposed on Hong Kong. Uh, The biggest, uh, perhaps, is the suspension of the extradition treaty with Hong Kong. Is this something the United Kingdom is prepared to do? Um, I'm pretty certain that there are a number of other steps that are under consideration. Obviously, when we when we look at what we're going to do, we will be discussing it with our very closest partners, uh, particularly uh, those who are members of the Five Eyes Alliance. So I'm pretty certain that there are a number of things under consideration. And the fact that Canada's taken this step, it, it will be worth us looking at all sorts of things. But that, I imagine, might be one of the things we'd be looking at. I, I honestly don't know, um, but I know that our ministers are in regular contact about this sort of thing. You know, given that they've now pretty clearly breached the 1985 uh, joint declaration on the one country, two systems, can countries trust China to live up to its word on really any kind of an international agreement right now? Well, I think that, that that's what we're talking about here, isn't it? We are, we are talking about a country which is which is flagrantly a breached an international treaty. Um, no, the the, uh, the provisions of that uh, agreement uh, are supposed to run until until at least 2048, uh, and China has run has ridden roughshod over it. So I think yeah, there are questions about how far you can you can uh, you can accept their uh, their willingness to abide by any obligation that they have entered into. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't want to say that they are untrustworthy uh, across the board. But on this particular instance, yes, they are, they are not abiding by the terms of a treaty to which they have signed up. The Secretary of State in the United States, Mike Pompeo, he's described this new security law as the death knell for the high degree of autonomy that had been promised to Hong Kong. Is Hong Kong lost? 
Uh, I don't think it's lost. Uh, I think one of the things about Hong Kong is that it is an enormous driver of economic uh, growth uh, within China. Um, and one of the reasons that that growth has continued and that, China, that Hong Kong has been so successful is precisely because of the one country, two systems uh, arrangement. So um, I think there are, there are all sorts of advantages to China of Hong Kong having the status it does and having the the freedoms that it has so you know I think there are this this is not a this is not a win-win for China in imposing and destroying that system but they seem to be doing these things under sort of the, the cover of COVID right while the world is distracted with with other crises on, that are on their front door so do you see any scenario in which China backs off on what it's doing in Hong Kong well, we, we believe that if we keep making the case and uh, and and, uh, and and do so in good company, um, you know, I believe in diplomacy. That's why I do the job I do. So uh, we will continue to exert that pressure in the hope that China does back off. You know, Canada has had a, a series of problems and has not been able to get China to back off, in particular uh, on the detention of the two Michaels, the Canadians, Michael Kovrig and, and Michael Spaver. Uh, there has been a group of, of well-known Canadians uh, pressuring the Trudeau government to do what essentially amounts to a, a prisoner swap with Meng Wanzhou, the Huawei executive. Where would the United Kingdom stand on a move like that if Canada were to do what Trudeau is being pressured to do here? I, I think that's that's a decision for Canada to take. But I think it's 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 uh, you know there's a, there's a there's a big difference between somebody who's been legitimately detained under house arrest in quite uh, comfortable conditions, uh, do, with the due process of law behind it, uh, and the arbitrary t detention of two citizens who are being kept in solitary confinement with no contact with the outside world. So I think it's very difficult to equate those two things on an equal basis. Do you think we're headed into a prolonged period, though, of, uh, I guess, Chinese intransigence in a lot of ways? I mean, in Canada, we have the Meng Wanzhou situation. Hong Kong, obviously, is of, of enormous significance. And then there's the whole battle over Huawei and, and the possibility it's going to be kicked out of the, any role in the 5G network in your country and here. I mean, how do these relations start to normalize? Because I know you say you're a diplomat and you believe in diplomacy. Uh, the Chinese don't seem to be very diplomatic right now. I think you. I think we are seeing a much more aggressive uh, and much more forceful form of Chinese diplomacy. Um, it's not a form of diplomacy I think which is uh, successful in the long term. I think you get far better results if you are if you talk to people than if you try and coerce them into to doing things. Um, but I think we are all adapting to 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 a to a world in which China is playing a rather different role in a different way than it has in the past. And I think we're all uh, we are all grappling with that. And I think we have to accept that. You know, the balance of power has shifted very definitely from from the end of the Cold War to where we are now. Um, but I think it's you know it, it is the role of Western democracies like ours to uh, to stand up to uh, unacceptable behaviour and continue to make the case for a rather different way of doing business. Okay, Hi, Commissioner. We're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.